But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. The unforgivable sin, also known as the unpardonable sin, is not an eternal sin. There is a cure for the unforgivable sin. What is the cure for the unforgivable sin? It's the same cure for every other sin that will ever be committed. The death and resurrection of the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the successful Savior, the slayer of sin, all sin. If your Jesus doesn't slay all sin, I suggest you get another Jesus, a better Jesus, a bigger Jesus. Before we zero in on the unforgivable sin, we must understand the big picture of what God and Christ have actually accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And later in this video, we will look at a key regarding the unforgivable sin as we examine forgiveness versus justification. Orthodox Christianity's leading mythmeister, John MacArthur, has read about and announced the big picture of God and Christ's work, but he doesn't believe it. Here are his words in the very same sermon exactly three minutes and 20 seconds after his lie about the unforgivable sin. He is the Messiah of Israel. He's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of the world. The Mythmeister is blinded by Satan and doesn't see the contradiction in his own words. Here now is the big picture of God and Christ's work regarding all sin. 1 Timothy 4.10 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. We rely on the living God who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. There you have it. The living God is the savior of all mankind. He can't be the savior of all mankind if there's a sin that prevents him from saving all mankind. Who are you going to believe? The Apostle Paul or Mythmeister MacArthur? Matthew 1, 21. Now Mary shall be bringing forth a son, and you, Joseph, shall be calling his name Jesus, for he shall be saving his people from their sins. John 3, 17. For God does not dispatch his son into the world that he should be judging the world, but that the world may be saved through him. Luke 19, 10. For the son of mankind came to seek and to save the lost. 1 John 4, 14. And we have gazed upon him and are testifying that the father has dispatched the son, the savior of the world. Does that sound familiar, Mr. MacArthur? Is this the savior of the world? John 1, 29. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Lo, the Lamb of God, which is taking away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ is constraining us, judging this, that if one died for the sake of all, consequently all died. I want to point out one thing in this verse. The phrase, for the sake of, is based on the Greek word huper, which means over, and means for the benefit of, for the betterment of. Jesus died to raise all over their current situation, which, for all mankind, was condemnation because of Adam's sin. If Jesus died for the benefit of all, for the betterment of all, then all will benefit and be better off because of his death. Colossians 1.20 And through Jesus to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. Hebrews 1.3 The Son of God, being the effulgence of God's glory and emblem of his assumption, besides carrying on all by his powerful declaration, making a cleansing of sins, is seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heights. While Jesus was cleansing sins, did he miss a spot? Not my Jesus. Romans 5, 18 through 20. Consequently then, as it was through one offense for all mankind for condemnation, thus also it is through one just award for all mankind for life's justifying. For even as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one, the many shall be constituted just. Yet law came in by the way that the offense should be increasing, Yet, where sin increases, grace super exceeds. Adam's disobedience brought condemnation to all mankind, and all were constituted sinners. Christ's obedience will justify all mankind. Grace super exceeds all sin, including the unforgivable sin. 
Romans 11:32 For God locks up all together in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. 1 Corinthians 15:22 For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. 1 Corinthians 15:28 Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. Look at all those beautiful alls. The scope of God's and Christ's work goes far beyond what orthodox Christianity is telling you. God sent Jesus to save us all, and that's exactly what he did. Because of that, God will be merciful to all. All will be vivified, meaning made immortal. And God will be in all who are subjected to him, and that's literally all, including his son, and including those who've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. That's the final paint stroke in God's big, beautiful picture. God being all in all. There is the big, glorious picture masterfully painted by God in his word. Satan successfully blinds people to the true and full work of God and Christ by using a multitude of lies. One of his most damaging and most successful lies is the myth surrounding the unforgivable sin. Let's hear the mythmeister one last time spouting this satanic lie. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. The mega myth surrounding the unforgivable sin does damage in at least two ways. First, it diminishes the work of God and Christ that we just looked at in the big picture. It makes it seem as if God is not the savior of all mankind and that Jesus is not the savior of the world and that grace super exceeds only some sin and that Jesus sought the lost but couldn't save the lost. There is a Jesus out there who does things half-assed. That's the orthodox Christian version of Jesus. But he's not the true Jesus. If we believe that there is even one sin that is too powerful for God and Christ to cure, we will end up in the doctrinal ditch just like Mythmeister John MacArthur and those who believe him. Second, the monstrous myth of the eternal unforgivable sin does damage to those who believe that there is such a sin that carries with it eternal consequences. And those who believe they've actually committed this sin believe that all hope for them is gone. They believe God has forsaken them forever and ever. They are told they are headed for God's everlasting hell with absolutely no possibility of rescue. This myth is one of the worst peace destroyers of all time. One who believes that all hope is gone for them will be greatly damaged by this huge satanic myth. So why is MacArthur and Orthodox Christianity so bloody wrong on this? Let's compare MacArthur's words to the words in the scriptures. Here are MacArthur's words in the Greek scriptures from Bible Hub. MacArthur's first words are fine, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. And this is a key to understanding Satan's deceptions in crappy Bible translations. The untrue words in a bad translation will be surrounded by good words, just as a small amount of rat poison is hidden within the edible part that attracts the rat, then kills it. The problem for the Mythmeister begins with his use of the word never. As you can see in the Greek, there is nothing that justifies the use of the word never. According to Strong's Concordance, never in the King James Version is the one word used to translate these four Greek words, auk, ice, ton, and iona. So MacArthur turns not for the age into never. The singular age, Iona, has a beginning and an end. This singular age may be an unspecified duration of time, but it is not an unlimited duration of time. Therefore, never is a very bad, misleading translation. Following the Greek, not ultra-literally, but closely, it's better to say whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit not has forgiveness for the age. Notice how Bible Hub's English translation messes up regarding Ion and Ionios. It treats the singular noun Iona correctly as age, but it breaks the rules and stretches the adjective Ionio into eternal. An Ion or age has a beginning and an end, and things that are Ionian have a beginning and an end. They are not eternal, which describes things that have no beginning and no end. And seriously, what is an eternal sin? How can a human being who has a beginning commit an eternal sin? What we see here are Satan's unsound words masquerading as God's words and contradicting God's pure words and deceiving many.
Now let's see the Mythmeister's words compared to a good translation of the Greek scriptures. Mark 3.29 from the Mythmeister. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And from the concordant literal New Testament. Yet whoever should be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is having no pardon for the eon, but is liable to the eonian penalty for the sin. We see agreement here in the first part. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and yet whoever should be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The difference begins with never has forgiveness and is having no pardon for the eon. This is referring to the eon in which Jesus spoke, the present wicked eon in which Satan holds a position as God or placer. So Jesus is telling us this sin won't be pardoned in this present eon. Then we see another massive difference in the last part of these two translations, but is guilty of an eternal sin and but is liable to the eonian penalty for the sin. Guilty of an eternal sin doesn't makes sense. The word eternal describes things that have no beginning and no end. Does this mean the blasphemer against the Holy Spirit has committed this sin for eternity, which is impossible? Or does this mean the penalty for this sin is eternal, which means it would have no beginning or end, which is another impossibility? The concordant version tells us Jesus said the blasphemer is liable to the Ionian penalty for the sin. This fits the Greek and reveals that the penalty is not eternal, but Ionian. In our immediate context, it is limited to the present wicked Eon. Jesus says more about this sin in the scriptures, but this truth alone, in this context, should begin to give you hope that this sin is not bigger than the true Jesus, the biggest Jesus. So what exactly is this sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It's written about several times in the scriptures and is found only in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Apostle Paul doesn't even mention it. All occurrences of this sin in the scriptures need to be examined to get Jesus' full teaching on this very important subject. Luke 12.10 And everyone who shall be declaring a word against the Son of Mankind, it shall be pardoned him. Yet the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit shall not be pardoned. If one looks only at Luke 12.10 regarding this sin, they will come away with no hope for the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. That one shall not be pardoned. My suggestion? Don't look only at Luke 12.10. We'll define blasphemy in our next passage. Mark 3, 22 through 30. And the scribes who descend from Jerusalem said that Beelzebul has he, and that by the chief of the demons is he casting out the demons. And calling them to him in parables, he said to them, How can Satan be casting out Satan? And if ever a kingdom should be parted against itself, that kingdom is not able to stand. And if ever a house should be parted against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan rose against himself and is parted, he is not able to stand, but is having a consummation. But no one is able to enter into the house of the strong one to plunder his gear. If ever he should not first be binding the strong one, and then he will be plundering his house. Verily I am saying to you that all shall be pardoned the sons of mankind, the penalties of the sins and the blasphemies, whatsoever they should be blaspheming. Yet whoever should be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is having no pardon for the eon, but is liable to the eonian penalty for the sin. For they said, An unclean spirit has he. Here is the fuller context of John MacArthur's words we saw earlier. In this passage, we see an expansion of revelation regarding the blaspheming against the Holy Spirit from what we just saw in Luke 12.10. The scribes who continually opposed Jesus couldn't deny his obvious power and deeds seen by the tremendous amount of miracles he had accomplished. And, very importantly, no one was ever able to prove that Jesus had sinned. He was pure, and so were his works. But the scribes accused Jesus, the sinless one, of obtaining his power from Beelzebul, the chief of demons, who was part of Satan's kingdom. They said, Beelzebul has he, by the chief of the demons is he casting out the demons. And they said, an unclean spirit has he. They blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the true source of Jesus' power, called elsewhere the finger of God and the spirit of God. The word blaspheme means harm avir, to declare or assert things that are harmful. A blasphemer spreads false accusations, he's a slanderer, one who injures the good name of another by making defamatory remarks. The scribes didn't just think their contradictory harmful thoughts, they vocalized them, which probably influenced some of those who heard their words. They said Beelzebul has he, by the chief of the demons is he casting out the demons, and they said an unclean spirit has he. Blasphemy is expressed in words, usually spoken words, but the words can also be written. 
Notice how Jesus distinguishes between sins and blasphemies. Blasphemy is a sin, but it is only one kind of sin. And notice that Jesus states that it is only the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that is having no pardon for the eon, but is liable to the eonian penalty for the sin. He did not say all sin against the Holy Spirit is having no pardon for the eon. Imagine if he'd said all sin and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is having no pardon for the eon, but is liable to the eonian penalty for the sin. This would sweep multitudes more people into this penalty who have sinned against the Holy Spirit, but haven't blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. We have no right to go beyond Jesus' words and include all sin against the Holy Spirit as being liable to the Eonian penalty. If one resists or rejects the testimony of the Holy Spirit about Jesus, that is a sin, but it is not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Notice that no details are given regarding the penalty except the fact that it is Eonian. It is pertaining to the eons. It is pertaining to an inherently unspecified duration of time. Beware, my fellow homo sapiens, many attempt to stick the label, the unforgivable sin, to various sins that have nothing to do with the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Some have wondered if suicide is the unforgivable sin. Some say unbelief is the unforgivable sin. Some have even questioned if porn is the unforgivable sin. Jesus is very precise in his words in describing this very heinous sin, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Do not take away from his words. Do not add to his words. Now let's look at another expansion of Revelation regarding this particular sin. Matthew 12, 22-32 Then was brought to him a demoniac, blind and mute, and he cures him, so that the mute man is speaking and observing. And amazed are all the throngs, and they said, Is not this the son of David? Now the Pharisees hearing it said, This man is not casting out the demons except by Beelzebul, the chief of the demons. Now having perceived their sentiments, he said to them, Every kingdom parted against itself is being desolated, and every city or house parted against itself shall not stand. And if the Satan is casting out the Satan, he is parted against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebul, am casting out demons, by whom are your sons casting them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. Now if by the Spirit of God I am casting out demons, consequently the kingdom of God outstrips in time to you. Or how can anyone be entering into the house of the strong one and plunder his gear, if ever he should not first be binding the strong one? And then he will be plundering his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who is not gathering with me is scattering. Therefore I am saying to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be pardoned men, yet the blasphemy of the Spirit shall not be pardoned. And whosoever may be saying a word against the Son of Man, it will be pardoned him. Yet whoever may be saying aught against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be pardoned him, neither in this eon nor in that which is impending. This time, it's the Pharisees who are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. This man is not casting out the demons except by Beelzebul, the chief of the demons. In this passage, we see Jesus give us more information regarding the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let's focus on verses 31 and 32 to see the expansion of Jesus' revelation of truth. Verse 31, Therefore I am saying to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be pardoned men, yet the blasphemy of the Spirit shall not be pardoned. This verse by itself leads to hopelessness and is very similar to Luke 12:10 that we saw earlier. So what do we do after becoming hopeless reading verse 31? We employ one of the greatest scripture study techniques of all time. Keep reading. Verse 32, And whosoever may be saying a word against the Son of Mankind, it will be pardoned him. Yet whoever may be saying aught against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be pardoned him, neither in this eon, nor in that which is impending. Jesus reveals more information regarding the time in which this sin will not be pardoned. It shall not be pardoned him, neither in this eon, nor in that which is impending. Jesus reveals that pardon is withheld from the blasphemer for two eons. This eon we are presently in, and that singular eon which is impending, which includes the 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth and the great white throne judgment. But here is a key truth that many in orthodox Christianity miss. There is an eon to come after the singular impending eon. We can see this in Ephesians 2.7 and Luke 1.33. Ephesians 2 7, that in the oncoming eons he should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Luke 1 32 through 33, and he shall be great, and the Son of the Most High shall he be called. 
and the Lord God shall be giving him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for the eons, and of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. These two oncoming eons are the eon that contains the 1,000 year reign of Christ and the great white throne judgment, and the eon of the new heaven and the new earth. These are the eons of the eons, which are the two good eons out of the five total eons. These are the two eons in which Jesus and his servants will be reigning on the earth for the eons of the eons. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was spoken about only by Jesus while he was face to face with Israel as the servant of the circumcision. The penalty for this sin would have been especially painful for an Israelite who hoped to rule and reign with Messiah in his earthly kingdom. All of us have been unpardoned at some point in our lives. Some will die unpardoned. As Jesus said, they will die in their sins. Is this their final end? No. Uh, okay, smart guy. Then what? What happens to those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Huh? It's important to see the distinction between pardon slash forgiveness and justification, as this is a great key to our understanding God and Christ's cure for the unforgivable sin. Excellent! The pardoning of a sinner is not the only way God deals with sin. He also justifies sinners, and there is a difference. Just like all of us, William and Theodore have sinned. They are both guilty sinners. Let's see how God deals differently with each of them regarding their sin. We can see the distinction between pardon and justification in Romans 4, 6-8, through 8, where the Apostle Paul quotes David, even as David also is telling of the happiness of the man to whom God is reckoning righteousness apart from acts, Happy they whose lawlessnesses were pardoned and whose sins were covered over. Happy the man to whom the Lord by no means should be reckoning sin. As we see in verse 7, pardon operates in connection with law. It is the pardon of lawlessness. Verse 6 tells us righteousness slash justification has nothing to do with acts. Verse 7 reveals the truth about pardon. William's lawlessnesses and sins were pardoned and covered over. This happened when he repented from his dead works. Pardon means to be let off from the penalty of sin. William was let off of the hook. God looks at William and says, You are wrong, you're guilty, but I let you off the hook, and I cover your sins, and you will suffer no penalty for them. Verses 6 and 8 tell us about justification, that the Lord is reckoning righteousness to the justified apart from acts. God declares Theodore to be right and not guilty. God doesn't reckon sin to Theodore. He doesn't let Theodore off the hook because he is justified and not on the hook. God looks at Theodore as he looks at Christ and says, you are right, you are not guilty. Did Christ need to be let off the hook for any sin and guilt? No, neither does Theodore who has been justified. Theodore didn't gain his justified status by repentance or any other good works. It's a declaration of God that occurred when he granted Theodore belief. God gave Theodore God's own righteousness. Regardless of what others declare about Theodore or what he declares about himself, the declaration that is superior is what God God says about Theodore. Regardless of what Theodore has done or does, if God says he's righteous, then he's righteous. Romans 4:17. God is calling what is not as if it were. Notice that both William and Theodore are happy as we see in verses 7 and 8. Pardon and justification are both good, but justification is better. Unfortunately for William, he can be put back on the hook. His pardon is conditional. His sins that were covered over can be uncovered. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you should be forgiving men their offenses, your heavenly Father also will be forgiving you. Yet if you should not be forgiving men their offenses, neither will your Father be forgiving your offenses. We see an example of this in Jesus' parable in Matthew 18, 23 through 35. In that parable, a debtor owed the king an enormous amount of money. The king let him off the hook by pardoning the debt, and the man did not have to suffer the penalty. But a short time later, that man did did not pardon another man who owed him a small debt and had him thrown into jail. The king heard about this and removed his initial pardon from the big debtor. So we see that a person doesn't have to experience pardon to be justified. And we see from Romans 5 that all will eventually be constituted just because of Christ's obedience. Romans 5, 18 through 19. Consequently then, as it was through one offense for all mankind for condemnation, thus also it is through one just award for all mankind for life's justice. 
justifying. For even as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one, the many shall be constituted just. Now let's see how justification is God's solution for the unpardonable sin. Now let's see an example of Simon the scribe, blasphemer against the Holy Spirit, and how God will cure him. Here is Simon the scribe. He constantly hounded Jesus and blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Simon died in his sins in 43 AD. He died unforgiven. Simon will be dead throughout the remainder of this present wicked eon. Simon will not be resurrected when Christ returns to set up his 1,000 year earthly kingdom at the end of this eon. Simon's beloved Israel will rule and reign over the earth with Israel's Messiah. Simon will miss out on that glorious time for Israel. This is at least part of the eon penalty that comes with blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Simon, along with all of the rest of the dead, will be resurrected to judgment at the great white throne. This is where it gets interesting. Let's see Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I perceived the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were judged each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Simon the scribe will be judged for blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The Ionian penalty for his sin will be continued at the great white throne judgment. Will he then be pardoned at the great white throne after undergoing his penalty? No, the great white throne is part of one of the eons in which this sin will not be pardoned. But could he possibly be justified there? Yes. If Simon is found written in the scroll of life and justified there, he will go on to the new earth as a mortal. His Ionian penalty for his blasphemy will be complete, having been dead and missing out on the 1,000 year reign and whatever penalty he experiences at the great white throne. If Simon is not found written in the scroll of life, he will be cast into the lake of fire where he will be killed and his Ionian penalty will continue throughout the new heaven and new earth eon. Uh, okay, smart guy. Then what? What happens to those Holy Spirit blasphemers who are cast into the lake of fire? Ah! At the consummation of the eons, at the end of the new heaven and new earth eon, the last enemy, which is death, the second death, will be abolished. And all who are dead in the lake of fire, including Simon and the others who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, will live. They will be the last class of people to be vivified, which is made immortal and incorruptible. Simon will not be pardoned. He will be justified, which is far better than pardon. He will be reconciled. He will return into God, and God will be all in all including Simon, the one who blasphemed the Holy Spirit. This glorious goal will be achieved by God. He will be all in all. Do not doubt it. And it's all based on his work with his son in Jesus' death and resurrection. Orthodox Christianity's great mythmeister, John MacArthur, did speak true words. He is the Messiah of Israel. He's the Savior of the world. Too bad he doesn't yet believe his very own mouth. Someday he will. People of the world. Hear God. Where sin increases, grace super exceeds.